recent years, the control of automotive emissions has become a topic of great concern in America. This concern has resulted in the evolution of another major automotive system, a system that utilizes principles and hardware that were unheard of only a few short years ago. The emphasis on emissions control reflects the dramatic shift that's occurred in the priorities of American consumers. American drivers have always had very specific ideas as to what a car should be. In past years, the general consensus was, quite simply, the bigger the better. A good share of the car buying public wanted the biggest, plushest, heaviest boat they could afford. Many of those who didn't demand these mobile living rooms plopped down their hard-earned bucks for any one of a number of available muscle cars. The drivers in this category had only one goal in mind, to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. And the big bore free-breathing V8s delivered the goods. Well, it's a fact of life that our world is in a state of constant change. And in the last decade or so, new social and economic considerations have arisen in our society. We've been forced to come to grips with the fact that crude oil and our other natural resources are indeed limited. No matter how hard we may wish for inexhaustible sources of petroleum, it just ain't going to be. Growing concern for the quality of the very air we breathe has also given drivers cause to view their motor vehicles in a new light. No one wanted to see the situation come down to this, that's for sure. In response to the new priorities, each model year has brought with it new advances in emission control technology. It's up to you and me to see that these emission control systems remain in top condition. And let's face it, as working professionals, it isn't always easy to stay on top of the latest changes in hardware and maintenance procedures. This program is designed to bring you up to date on all of the emission control systems now being used on AMC and Jeep vehicles. The program consists of two films, the one you're watching now and its counterpart, Emission Controls Part 2. The films themselves offer illustrated explanations of each system's theory of operations. In the reference books that accompany the films, you'll find the testing and service procedures you can use to keep the various systems in top operating order. In the films, we'll see how some of the emission control systems perform their duties before combustion occurs. Other systems perform their duties during the combustion process. Still others perform their duties after the combustion process takes place. In the films, we'll be using a new type of quiz system. After we examine a system, this stop sign will appear on the screen. When you see the sign, simply shut the projector off and read the suggested pages in the reference book. All the bell units, however, will automatically shut themselves off. At the end of the suggested reading, you'll find a short quiz on the film and the reference book material. After you read the suggested section, take the quiz. The answers, which are circled here, are located at the bottom of the page. After you've checked your answers, turn the machine back on. For those of you with label units, simply push the start button. Take your time reading the suggested section and taking the quiz. Remember that the projector and film aren't going anywhere and will wait patiently for you to continue. Let's begin by looking at the automotive emissions themselves. Two of the emissions, water vapor and carbon dioxide, are harmless. Shown here is the main reason that the automobile contributes to air pollution. The gasoline that fuels the engine contains liquid, flammable hydrocarbons. The brown squares here represent the hydrocarbons. The problem is that some of the hydrocarbons leave the vehicle and enter the atmosphere. There are four potential sources for the release of unburned hydrocarbons into the atmosphere. The carburetor, the crankcase, the fuel tank, and the exhaust system. On a typical vehicle, approximately 60% of the hydrocarbons emitted are released through the exhaust system. About 20% of the hydrocarbons that are emitted by a vehicle are released with crankcase vapors. These are blow-by gases that blow past the piston rings and accumulate in the crankcase. Crankcases must be ventilated to prevent pressure buildup of these gases. This also prevents sludge formation due to condensation. In the old days, these gases were simply routed out a road draft tube, like the one shown here. The remaining 20% of the hydrocarbons emitted by a vehicle are not the result of the combustion process. 
As shown here, these hydrocarbons are released when gasoline in the carburetor and fuel tank evaporates. This process takes place even when the engine isn't running. In addition to hydrocarbons, there's another gas that's present in the exhaust gases. This is carbon monoxide, which results directly from the burning of gasoline. The black circles here represent carbon monoxide. This gas, of course, is lethal if breathed in high concentrations. There's one more type of pollutant that's created as a direct result of the combustion process. Nitrogen oxides, or NOx, are a product of the air used in the mixture, not the gasoline. The triangles here represent nitrogen oxides. Air is a mixture of about 20% oxygen and 80% nitrogen. When air is exposed to the high temperatures in the combustion chamber, these NOx gases are formed. These same three pollutants, hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxides, are also present in the crankcase vapors as well as in the exhaust system gases. So those are the culprits, hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxides. Now let's get to the systems used to combat these potential pollutants. Let's start out with the crankcase ventilation system. As we've already seen, the old engine simply dumped blow-by gases directly into the atmosphere. This is called an open crankcase ventilation system. In those days, air entered the crankcase via an open oil filler cap, which was also called a breather. The fresh air would simply mix with the blow-by gases in the crankcase, and this mixture was expelled through the road draft tube. This setup is enough to bring tears to the eyes of most environmentalists today. The system we use today is a closed or positive type system. The fresh air enters the system through the carburetor air cleaner and is routed through an air inlet hose to the oil filler cap, which is a closed design. In the crankcase, the fresh air mixes with the crankcase vapors. This mixture then flows through a one-way PCV valve into the intake manifold. Here, the vapors are mixed with the air-fuel mixture and burned in the combustion chamber. The fresh air and crankcase vapors are drawn through the system by intake manifold vacuum. Here's how the PCV valve works. Under heavy acceleration, low intake manifold vacuum is present. The pink here indicates this low vacuum. The spring pressure on the PCV valve piston is more powerful than the vacuum, so the piston is forced back away from the opening in the valve body. The large opening allows for a large flow of vapors into the intake manifold. The red here indicates high intake manifold vacuum, which is present at idle and cruising speeds. The high vacuum overcomes the spring pressure on the piston, and the piston moves into the opening in the valve body. Vapor flow is now reduced, which is fine because vapor pressure is low at this time. This low flow also assures smooth idle. Remember that the low intake manifold vacuum that's present during heavy acceleration allows the PCV valve to open up, allowing for a large flow of vapors. Sometimes, though, crankcase vapor pressure exceeds the flow of the valve. When this happens, the excess vapors are forced back up the oil filler pipe and into the air cleaner, as shown here. From there, they are drawn through the carburetor and are burned along with the air-fuel mixture. Stop the projector and read pages 1 through 6 in the reference booklet. Remember, LaBelle units will automatically shut off. Take the quiz, then turn the projector on again. The next emissions control component we're going to check out is the automatic choke. A lot of people think that the automatic choke has only one function, to facilitate cold starts. But the automatic choke also helps reduce emission of carbon monoxide during engine warm-up. Two types of automatic chokes are used on our vehicles. The one on the left relies on exhaust heat to warm its thermostatic coil. The one on the right, however, uses electricity to warm its coil. Excluding this difference in heat sources, both types perform identical functions on their respective carburetors. There's another design that's used on some vehicles which utilizes exhaust heat and electricity to warm the coil. For simplicity, we'll concentrate on the internally heated type, specifically the one used on the YF model. The main components of this circuit are the choke valve, choke cover, 
thermostatic coil, choke piston, exhaust heat inlet, choke rod, and vacuum passage. Here the engine's cold and is neither running nor being cranked over. With the accelerator partially depressed, the coil tension is holding the choke valve completely closed. Now the cold engine is being cranked over. The pink here represents low intake manifold vacuum, which causes the choke piston to be pulled downward into the vacuum in the piston bore. This forces the choke lever to wind the coil up against its tension and the choke valve to open slightly. Now the engine has just started. The thermostatic coil tension is balanced by the pull of vacuum on the piston and the force of the air stream against the offset choke valve. The green arrows represent this air stream. This choke valve position is known as initial choke valve clearance. As the engine temperature increases, warm air, which is heated by the exhaust manifold, passes through the slots and into the thermostatic coil housing. The heat causes the thermostatic coil to gradually lose its tension until the choke valve is in its wide open position. Adjustment and service procedures pertaining to the automatic chokes vary somewhat from carburetor to carburetor. Consult the appropriate technical service manual for the correct procedure used on any specific carburetor. Now let's turn to the catalytic converter, an emission control device that some people find a bit mysterious. All AMC and Jeep vehicles now use a pellet type converter like the one shown here. The role of the catalytic converter is to neutralize our old friends hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. The catalytic converter does not concern itself with the control of nitrogen oxides. In the second film, we'll look at the systems that control nitrogen oxides. This cutaway reveals the contents of the stainless steel canister. In the center are thousands of pellets, which initiate the catalyst activity. These pellets are shielded from the converter's outer skin by the layers of insulation visible here. Each of the catalytic pellets is actually an alumina bead coated with platinum and palladium catalyzing agents. Here's how the pellet type converter works. When the hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide gases in the exhaust gases contact the catalytic pellets, a chemical reaction occurs. The result of this reaction is that the hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide gases are converted to harmless water vapor, H2O, and carbon dioxide gas, CO2. The temperature in the converter during the chemical reaction is somewhat higher than that of the exhaust gases as they leave the engine. The insulation in the converter keeps the outside skin at about the same temperature as the muffler. But due to its larger mass, the converter stays hot much longer than the muffler. Some vehicles sold in California feature a monolithic type warm-up converter mounted between the engine and the pellet type converter. The warm-up converter reacts more rapidly to incoming gases. It is particularly effective in converting exhaust gases immediately after startup. Although the warm-up converter initiates the same type of chemical reaction as the pellet type converter, it is constructed differently. As you can see, this unit utilizes two ceramic honeycombs coated with palladium and platinum versus the pellets in the pellet type converter. The honeycomb substrates are fired in a kiln to bond the individual layers and thus provide a uniform ceramic structure. Note that an asbestos seal provides heat insulation. This converter, just like the pellet type, changes hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide into harmless water vapor and carbon dioxide gas. Stop the projector and read pages 7 through 12 in the reference book. Take the quiz, then turn the projector back on. The thermostatically controlled air cleaner, TAC system, provides pre-warmed air to the carburetor air cleaner during engine warm-up. This improves engine warm-up and minimizes carburetor icing. But the TAC system also reduces hydrocarbon emissions because it permits the carburetor to be calibrated leaner. This system is typical of the TAC systems used on our vehicles. All AMC and Jeep vehicles utilize similar systems. A flexible hose coming from an exhaust system shroud directs warm air into the air cleaner snorkel. 
the thermal sensor, vacuum motor, and air valves then direct either exhaust heated air, ambient air, or a combination of the two into the carburetor. Here the engine is warming up. The thermal sensor senses that the air in the air cleaner is cold, so it routes manifold vacuum to the vacuum motor. This vacuum overcomes the force of the spring and the diaphragm is pulled up, opening the air valve. Now the exhaust manifold heated air is directed into the carburetor. Now the temperature of the incoming ambient air has approached 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Sensing this, the sensor cuts off manifold vacuum and opens the air bleed valve. This vents the trapped vacuum to the atmosphere. The spring pressure in the vacuum motor forces the air valve closed. The carburetor is now receiving ambient air. Keep in mind, though, that this process takes place gradually as the engine warms. If the TAC system malfunctions, poor drivability during engine warm-up can result. The air guard air injection system is used on all of our vehicles. Shown here are the various components incorporated within the system. The function of the air guard system is to reduce hydrocarbon and carbon monoxide emissions released through the exhaust system. These emissions are reduced by the process illustrated here. The pump air, the green arrows, comes in contact with the hot exhaust gases, indicated here by the blue arrows. Contained in these gases are hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide. The oxygen in the air ignites, which causes additional burning of the hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide gases. Here's how the system works. An engine-driven air pump pumps the air through the diverter valve and a check valve into the air injection manifold where the air is distributed to each engine exhaust port. This is how the diverter valve functions under most driving conditions. The pink represents equal vacuum on both sides of the diaphragm, which allows the diaphragm to remain in this position due to spring tension. The metering valve allows the fresh air to pass through to the air injection manifold. In a rapid deceleration situation, High intake manifold vacuum is applied to the underside of the diaphragm. The bright red here represents high vacuum. The vacuum overcomes spring tension and the diaphragm is forced down until the metering valve is forced into this position. The pump air is now vented to the atmosphere. The diverter valve remains in the bypass mode only momentarily due to the presence of this diaphragm bleed hole. This design allows the high vacuum on the bottom side of the diaphragm to bleed into the area on top of the diaphragm. Thus, the valve quickly returns to its normal position. If the diverter valve's diaphragm is ruptured or vacuum to the valve is disrupted, a loud popping noise may result. A check valve is located on the air injection manifold between the manifold and the diverter valve. As shown on the left here, the check valve is open when the diverter valve is directing air to the manifold. The check valve closes, as shown on the right, during the diverter bypass operation or when the pump isn't operating. With the check valve closed, the exhaust gases can't flow back to the hoses and air pump. The exhaust gases could damage these components. Stop the projector and read pages 13 through 19 in the reference book. Take the quiz then turn the projector back on. Our next emissions control system is the vacuum throttle modulating VTM system. This system is used on some vehicles to reduce the emission of hydrocarbons during rapid throttle closure at high speeds. As you can see, there are three principal components involved here. The deceleration or decel valve, the throttle modulating diaphragm at the carburetor, and a manifold vacuum source. During most engine operation, there is fairly low vacuum present. This low vacuum is shown here in pink. As long as the vacuum level stays below approximately 21 inches, the system looks like this. Note that the throttle modulating diaphragm plunger is retracted. Here there is very high vacuum present because the engine is decelerating. The high vacuum at the decel valve triggers a vacuum signal to the throttle modulating diaphragm. Consequently, the plunger moves out and opens the throttle slightly. 
the increased throttle opening allows air to continue to enter the combustion chambers and lean out the overrich mixture. This reduces the emission of hydrocarbons. Well, that concludes part one of our emission controls program. In part two, we'll look at the other emission control systems used on AMC and Jeep vehicles. <laughs>